And welcome back! Today in Teardown and Analysis, the Ultrasound CTD500 Stereo Cassette Deck. Now you may want to watch the previous video where we took a closer look at this and where I already said something about what this uh, is all about and why I'm taking this apart. So uh, anyway, as we look at the bottom, you can see it's pretty scratched up and oxidized and kind of rusty as well, so yeah. Not in the best condition. We are going to start at the bottom because uh, that's where all the screws are that are going to uh, let us into this. Now look at that. <laughs> Never bothered to clean that out. I'm ashamed of myself. There we have the bottom of the unit. Right here, of course, uh, the mechanism and has some cables kind of in the way. Down here we have a flywheel, pretty decently sized, for what it is at least. Uh, power supply is down here. We do have a uh, regulator transistor in this. Uh, I think it's, I think it's, yep, it's just some transistor, so it has got to be a Zener diode as well to make that work. Uh, in the shielded box right there, that's another nice touch. That's actually shielded. There we have the bias oscillator, oscillator coil, a couple of capacitors and some trim pots to get that adjusted. The, um, yeah, I'm jumping all over the place. <laughs> this is the record playback switch and as you can see this is one of these setups that has a, uh, a wire going to the actual record button. That's uh, what's inside of this hose. We press record, that would move this uh, switch over and it would just uh, slide into the record position, like so. We got some more adjustments. Uh, let's see, yep, those are the Dolby circuits, so those are most likely for the Dolby to get that adjusted. I'm not seeing any op amps or, uh, well, I'm not seeing a whole lot of uh, ICs in this at all. Yep, all transistorized, so uh, I guess op amps would have been too expensive back then. Of course, in later years they were much cheaper than uh, discrete uh, transistor circuitry. This right here is the uh, Dolby on and off switch, it's kind of tucked into there. Not sure, yeah, you, you can. There we go. There it is. Not a whole lot of connections used on that, as you can see. So that's basically what's going on on the motherboard. This right here is the uh, selector for the uh, tape type. Let's uh, zoom out again and uh, take off the top cover. And, well, there is the uh, top cover. You can see my uh, sticky tape job right there. And in here, well, as you can see, not much exciting stuff in this. Um, let me zoom in on this again. Well, as you can see, we have the mechanism right there, and you can see it's a simple setup, it's all built around this uh, base part. A lot of plastic in this, a lot of plastic standoffs and wheels and all that. You can see that down there, for example. Um, there is a motor. Now, the motor originally was running too fast, and uh, this thing does not have a speed control. As you can see, no hole in the back. So there isn't much you can do about that except do something about the power supply. And that's what I did. Uh, <laughs> and that's what this is for in the back. That's the screw that we've seen in the last video. That right there is a uh, 7812 voltage regulator. 
has just uh, one capacitor hooked up to it, which uh, is not ideal. Uh, I guess I didn't have any at the time anymore. But uh, that brings the input voltage to the motor down to 12 volts. And that actually makes the motor run the way it should. It also makes the motor run permanently. Originally that was uh, just as usual. There was a switch in this that would turn the motor on as soon as you press play. Now the thing was back then the belt was kind of weak so you always got this uh, kind of uh, fade in effect when you press play where it would first play very slow and then it would just go whoop and uh, finally reach the uh, correct speed. So found that to be kind of annoying so what I did was I bypassed the uh, usual switch and so this is just permanently running off that uh, 12 volt regulator and uh, so as soon as you turn it on motor spins up. You can also see uh, when I did that I believe right there it says 2008. So that's that. I have the uh, transformer behind it there. It is a shielded transformer which is kind of nice. That's the fuse obviously. There is that uh, messed up switch. Now what had happened, now, well now that it doesn't matter anymore I might as well show it to you. This had just uh, been pushed in and had gone open so uh, basically well, I can't get it apart now I guess. Yeah, kind of like, the, as you can see, that this was just lying in there all loose. And so I had to kind of get this back into there and push that back together. So, that's that. Now, I guess I can go ahead and remove the faceplate. Well, actually, okay, didn't remember that. You can see, haha. <laughs> There's a weird add-on board on this. I'm not sure what that would be good for. But uh, there it is. No active components on this, just some potentiometer. So probably adjusts the, uh, the level meters up front. We're going to see those once I have the faceplate taken off. Well, the faceplate has been removed. That's what's inside of that thing. Plastic's been glued in. Nothing too terribly special. So, uh, put that to the side. And this is what's going on behind of it. Let me just uh, turn this around. You can see it's kind of an uh, interesting setup. This right here. I've got some cardboard surrounding those LEDs. It looks kind of nice. Now these uh, things screw off like so. And then you can take this off for uh, cleaning purposes primarily of course. This right here is the level meter and uh, wow this has faded over the years. You might be able to see this. Uh, the edges are brown, just this typical kind of early 80s brown. This is just kind of kind of a greenish gray. So uh, that has uh, definitely uh, seen a lot of sunlight. Here we have a good close-up of the head assembly. Obviously pinch roller is right there. It's in uh, pretty sad condition that thing. I have uh, head, record playback head right there and then of course erase head over there and there we have this uh, hideously primitive auto stop mechanism. If you uh, press play, you then push it, push that lever, it's, uh, it's going to cause the whole thing to disengage if the motor is running. Right now it won't do it. Well, mechanism still doesn't want to know about uh, coming out of here. But we have successfully removed the Dolby switch, which is uh, hiding down there. As you can see, it's having one of these uh, 
long pieces of plastic on the switch to connect that. So uh, that was kind of a flimsy example for that uh, way of doing it because it, uh, it, it would just uh, flex a lot and wasn't very stable. So uh, there it is. What is that? A, uh, a times four two position uh, switch. Clicky switch. Here is this uh, view meter thing. You can probably see how much that has faded over the years. Let's take the view meter out. Let's see how this is being done. Oh, an LB1416. So, let's see. The interesting bit is, uh, this was actually used, for as far as I know, in a lot of sharp cassette decks. And uh, that's a uh, common component made by Sanyo. This, uh, well, maybe this was some sort of a standard board that you could acquire back then, and to make it fit, they had to uh, come up with this. Uh, weird little adjustment board. As you can see, two potentiometers on there for the two channels. That's how that is being done. Here is a level regulator. Just took that out. Standard component, a stereo potentiometer, 20 kilo ohms. And that's of course the problem with these uh, small cassette decks. The smaller they are, the harder it gets to service them. Of course, right now this is not exactly servicing them, but um, well, you get the point. <laughs> Take the fuse out, maybe that's going to help. Heat shrink wire all over that. We got ourselves a fuse holder. I can just get that to come out. That is. Well, there we go. There it is. 12 amps. Well, that's uh, well and truly overdimensioned for this application. That thing. Okay, there is that, there it is, a little, there it is, a little transformer, single input voltage, of course, it's not international or anything like that, uh, I just go down here, it does, yeah, it does have multiple tabs on it. Uh, okay, two different voltages on that, as you can see, yellow and orange. And then, of course, the input. Which, uh, just going to take off, like so. And there it is. A little transformer. Now, I will have to say, for a cassette deck, this is actually quite good. This is quite nicely dimensioned. I have seen cassette decks in later years that had a higher power consumption because they were dual cassette deck units, so they had to power two motors and a lot more LEDs and all that. Um, and the transformers were actually smaller. So uh, I'm happy with that. I did use heat sink grease to mount this. To the back panel. I mounted that there deliberately because I uh, wanted to have the uh, back panel as the heat sink. Uh, wasn't really necessary. I mean, I don't know how well the regulation with this even worked because uh, obviously to work reliably and properly these uh, 7-8 type uh, voltage regulators have to have a 3-volt uh, difference between the input and the output. And I'm really sure um, 
the difference in this case was actually much much lower like you know maybe one and a half volts maybe just one volt it was very marginal but uh, there it is LM7812 that is glad I got that one back because uh, I'm actually needing this for another project <laughs> so well looks like I don't have to buy another one Uh, the input jacks are being put in place with uh, these uh, stupid plastic pieces that you push in, these uh, push-in knobs or whatever. Oh, this one actually manages... These ones actually manage to come out without problems. Usually these uh, tend to be kind of uh, pain. Okay, there we go, put those into the trash, right where they belong. Oop. Yeah, it's really falling to pieces. Okay, right, I guess. <laughs> It has fallen apart. It has all fallen apart. There is the uh, back panel once again. I can already put that to the side because that's going to be heavily modified real soon. Power cord. Don't really need another one of those. I'll have to check if it. Uh, is all in one piece. These are the side bits, of course, holding it all together. There is the uh, power switch. <laughs> There's a huge piece of uh, heat shrink tubing around it. But also on this one, as you can see, nicely done. A little uh, spark killer capacitor. And uh, that's something they left away on uh, more modern units. Uh, I always hate it. Hated it so much, in fact, that uh, on some equipment I actually uh, put in that uh, part, that little capacitor, when I was hearing the uh, pop noises while turning on or turning off the device. Here is our uh, 6.3 millimeter quarter inch. Uh, Headphone jack, and yep, there is the uh, front. As you can see, not much to it, except two little LEDs. Whole thing is yeah, kind of yeah, oh dear. It's really easy to bend this thing, so eh, went kind of cheap on this. Well, I guess. Well, to be fair, they didn't have a lot of space. For, uh, for any sort of reinforcements. So, uh, that's why that's all so small. These, uh, okay, well, that's an interesting job. These uh, LEDs are just holding in into some halfway deteriorated rubber. That's kind of cheap. Well, let's take that right out. Okay, what's that? Oh, bend. Oh well. And now we finally have the two things almost separated. And here you can see how I uh, soldered the negative of the motor to the uh, chassis ground. I'm not sure if I can. Uh, uh, it's kind of hiding in there. I'm not sure where the original uh, motor switch would have been in this. That's the other end of the record playback switch. Just hooks up right there and uh, then uh, of course this is just being uh, pushed up or down. That's how that works. You can take this off. 
somehow, yep, it just clips in like so. You can take that out, and as you can see, there is a little slider. When I slide this, you can uh, hopefully see right there on the other end that is sliding around quite happily. And that's it. There is that. Now we've already taken a look at the board, so we can take one very last look. Nothing special to this, of course. There it is. And here we have the mechanism, the counter. This is using three belts, one for the counter, one for uh, this little thing right there, which drives the take-up and supply reel, and then, of course, flat capstan belt. There is the uh, flywheel. Oh, I guess I have... Hmm, well, I have to correct myself. This really isn't all too terribly big. I have seen uh, bigger ones, even in cheap cassette decks. Got myself another tape counter. Then we have the motor board out. You can see as a little standard kind of Mabuchi brand motor hooked up to it. Oh dear, oh dear. Oh yes, and after all those years, <laughs> put your screwdriver through that label and there it is. That's your speed control, right there. Can't really grab it with a screwdriver right now, but there is a little potentiometer down in there. So, yep, great job. That would have been it. <laughs> uh, anyway, it doesn't matter anymore. Let me uh, get this thing unmounted. And then... That's going to be it. Hey, there is that. Two belts. Remember this belt, uh, pretty sure. This was actually one of the very first belt replacement jobs I ever did, and I do remember uh, this belt originally came out of a broken Denon cassette deck. Denon DRM07. Still remember that. There was our flywheel with a capstan on it. And yep, that is running in a, uh, in a plastic bearing. Let me zoom in on this again, like so. And uh, yeah, once again, as you can see, we do have this metal part as a base, and then all the rest is just uh, mostly plastic all around. This thing right here is uh, what uh, what would do the soft eject. I can just uh, see. It's not it. How do you? There we go. That's how that worked. Little uh, air cylinder right there. There, as you can see. If I uh, now go ahead and uh, take the thing off, like so, as you can see, no more soft eject. That's how they did that. Standard setup, I have seen that quite often. And always remember to take out these things right here, these little clips. Is, uh, these like to break and like to get lost, so you'll be glad if you have some replacements in your parts bin. With this thing, that clip being out of the way, we can now go ahead and just uh, pull out this whole entire thing. And that's going to be the end of the mechanism. There it is metal shaft. Another clip on it. That might actually be a useful part. 
And then of course all the buttons uh, just fall out. As you can see, it's uh, they do look surprisingly much like uh, like they actually were metal, but of course we look at the back. It's just uh, plastic. It's just plastic. They don't seem to be all too terribly worn out. Have to give them that. Well, it's not too much of a cheap plastic. This should now come off as well, like so. Get a little spring. And who now it's all really coming apart. Wow. Either it uh, has gotten lost at some point, or they never had anything to uh, secure the uh, pin shoulder in place. I didn't take out anything. Just fell off. There it is. Might be able to see shiny rubber. It's kind of uh, cracked as well, so that's no good as a replacement part. I mean, it did work all the way till the end, but um, still. Now we have our heads. They are adjustable, of course, as you'd expect for the time. So, let's see. As I said, I'm not sure if these things are uh, capable of uh, working with metal cassettes. That screwdriver might actually work better. Um, as obviously that requires heads that can uh, put out a lot more energy. Those would have been a lot more expensive. So a lot of cassette decks, especially in the early to mid 1980s, they claimed to be metal compatible. But all they could do was playback, no recording. There is the erase head. Let's uh, see. Yeah, it's in pretty decent condition. Is uh, what I believe is a ferrite head. Definitely not the uh, really cheap ones that just have a little magnet in them, or the uh, kind of cheap ones that uh, have an electromagnet in them, but plastic housing. This actually. It's a nice one. Then this one is the playback head. Of course, sealed, secured in place. One inside with a bias. No, what am I saying? The azimuth adjustment is tape alignment. There is that thing. It's kind of dirty, this thing. Well, it does show some uh, signs of uh, use. Well, I guess as a replacement part, it's going to be good enough. There it is. More plastic down in there. That's your uh, auto stop mechanism right there. Let's see if I can. Yeah, I can still engage the playback, and as you can see, this one would uh, push that lever up, and that would uh, do the stop if the motor was running, which of course it's not. And the last thing we're going to do is remove this the back part. It looks like we're going to make it just in time because the camcorder battery is dead. There it is. That's our uh, counter belt. As you can see, they did use uh, gears. They did use gears, but unfortunately also a little idler wheel. Eh, that's, that's not too good anymore either. You can see all those little rubber shavings in there. All this filth is uh, coming from that rubber. So, there it is, that was the mechanism. And that was the ultrasound model CTD 500 cassette deck. That was it. So, thank you for watching and see you again soon.